Now Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi, beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast Mass on this fifth Friday in Lent. And as I say, we commemorate today uh, St. Uh, Vincent Ferrer, uh, a Dominican and a priest of the late uh, 14th and early 15th century who died on this day in 1419. As a Dominican, he was a noted uh, preacher, uh, believed to have uh, uh, given, delivered over 20,000 uh, sermons and indeed to have converted as many souls to Christ with his preaching. Today's stational church in Rome, our spiritual pilgrimage around the Eternal City during this season of Lent, falls at the station of Saint Eusebius. Saint Eusebius was a priest of Rome uh, who was uh, imprisoned uh, under house arrest by the Arian uh, Emperor uh, Constantine, uh, Constantine um, uh, and for uh, seven months uh, was uh, uh, imprisoned in his home uh, until he died. Uh, he, of course, uh, defending and preaching uh, the Orthodox faith concerning the two natures of our Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps by happy coincidence, uh, but uh, St Eusebius's house and the, now the, uh, the, the church uh, was located in uh, a cemetery. And uh, so it was that uh, the catechumen and, and the penitents and the faithful with the Bishop of Rome uh, would process from the station of the, uh, from the collector uh, church uh, over the graves of these pagans to then enter into, we might say, the Church of the Resurrection. And indeed, resurrection theme, of course, is uh, uh, today's uh, lessons from Holy Mother Church. Now, remember, yesterday, too, we were given, similarly, uh, two resurrections, uh, one in the Old Testament and one by uh, Christ uh, in the Gospel, the raising of the widow of Nain. And yesterday's... Uh, uh, intention was directed particularly at the penitents. Today, which is uh, an older mass in origin, uh, is aimed particularly at the catechumen. The catechumen, remember, are those who were preparing for baptism and reception into the church on Holy Saturday during the great Paschal Vigil. We are, of course, only two weeks away now uh, from Good Friday, uh, literally today, in two weeks' time, and of course, Holy Saturday, uh, two weeks tomorrow. And one can imagine uh, the sense of growing excitement there must have been <clears throat> in the hearts and minds of those catechumen 1500 years ago as they were preparing for the great event. But just as yesterday, uh, Holy, Mother's Church, Holy Mother Church's uh, thoughts were directed towards the penitents, so too, of course, uh, are they uh, combined with those uh, intentions directed at the catechumen today. Remember that on Wednesday of this week, the catechumen went uh, through uh, uh, another uh, form of scrutiny, uh, uh, another form of testing and instruction uh, in preparation for their baptism. And they were given uh, the taste of salt as a symbol of wisdom. Uh, their ears uh, were uh, hands were laid upon their ears so that they might be open to hear the word of God and their eyes were anointed uh, so that they might see with the eyes of faith. And then of course uh, that theme continues uh, in uh, today's themes uh, for the Mass. We, my brothers and sisters, are reminded as Christians that we, of course, may and have received holy wisdom, that our ears have been opened to the word of God and our eyes should see with the eyes of faith. And we see this testing or examining, as it were, in our Lord's interaction with Martha and Mary, both of whom say that they have learned to believe that he is the Messiah. Both of them say that they uh, believe uh, in the resurrection of the dead, that they believe in his power 
uh, in his divine power. And likewise, my brothers and sisters, Holy Mother Church would uh, remind us uh, too to bear these things in mind, particularly as we enter more deeply now into the Passiontide season, which begins this Sunday. Just as our Lord gave the uh, uh, sight of the Transfiguration to Peter, James and John on Mount Tabor before, his, uh, before entering Jerusalem, uh, so too does Holy Mother Church present to us uh, on this occasion four uh, miracle stories of resurrection uh, to give us uh, something to hold on to and to remember uh, as we go deeper into the uh, Passiontide period. We, of course, as Christians, hopefully, have learned to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And after Wednesday's uh, uh, conference, uh, hopefully, uh, that has taken on an even uh, more uh, significant meaning uh, to us. And certainly, as I've tried to uh, suggest yesterday, and will uh, hammer the point home again today, uh, we, too, are uh, little anointed ones, we who bear the name Christian. The, t the name Christ means anointed one, means Messiah, and we who bear the name Christians, similarly, uh, are reminded that we too have been anointed. We are anointed at our baptism chris with chrismation and similarly at our confirmation. And in so doing, we were then initiated into the royal priesthood of our great High Priest, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, so that we, like him, no longer live in this world or live this life as ordinary people do. We have become ourselves. We have, uh, by adoption, uh, been uh, initiated into uh, the, uh, we might say, sacred ministry uh, to some extent. Uh, of course, not necessarily. Uh, there are, of course, different grades uh, of, of priestly ministry. Uh, and uh, there is, of course, a, a difference between the sacred ministry of the sacred ministers of deacons and priests and bishops uh, to that of the common uh, priesthood of all believers. But nonetheless, uh, we have all been gifted to share uh, in the benefits of our uh, Saviour's high priestly ministry. So that just as the high priests of Melchizedek, uh, by virtue of their anointing, became uh, representatives of God to earth and of earth to God, in like fashion, my brothers and sisters, do we share in that same characteristic, we who have been anointed by our baptism and reborn in Christ. And which means, of course, that we ourselves have experienced resurrection. Remember again from our thoughts on uh, Wednesday's conference that, uh, and as again as we touched on yesterday, uh, at the Feast of the Atonement uh, and the High Priest, uh, when he poured the blood of the Covenant uh, onto the cherubic throne, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, creation was reset, restored, refreshed, renewed. And when he then came out of the Holy of Holies, is it, it was as it were, uh, as if he had resurrected, having died with the old creation and being reborn with the new. Similarly, this is the same for us by virtue of our baptism. This is what we mean, what St Paul the Apostle means when he describes Baptism are being uh, are dying to the old self, to the old man, and being risen anew, reborn in Christ. In many ways, my brothers and sisters, we have experienced resurrection. We have not yet experienced the resurrection of the body, which is why uh, uh, we pray for that and we hope for that. That is our Christian hope, the resurrection of the body, which means the full completion and restoration of God with creation, which will occur at the end of time. But through our baptism already, as it were, our souls have gone through the experience of resurrection. 
so that our, our, so that the essence of our cells will now not die uh, at the end of uh, our earthly existence, but instead, of course, continue in eternal life. This is what we understand by the uh, Joanine principle of St. John's Gospel, that our citizenship of heaven began at our baptism, that our eternal life began at our baptism. And this should, my brothers and sisters, shape and change the way we think about ourselves and the way we interact with others. It should change the way we uh, uh, think about the world. This is what, it, again, what our Lord means uh, by the suggestion that we are, uh, though in the world, we are no longer of it. And what Holy Mother Church and through the centuries has mean, uh, uh, meant through various uh, poets to suggest that we live here as exiles. We are in exiles. Remember the uh, words of the um, uh, Salve that we say at the end of uh, Mass uh, to uh, the Mother of God. Uh, this veil of tears, we are exiled here. Meaning distant from the heavenly, our heavenly home from the heavenly Jerusalem by virtue of our present mortal existence. So this means, my brothers and sisters, that rather like Martha and Mary, we should live knowing that we are uh, already uh, enjoying eternal life. We should live knowing that the accidents and the incidents of this life are, as it were, almost of no importance, of no real significance, in the sense that because we are already immortal, because we already have eternal life, because we already are experiencing eternal life and we are promised the continuance of that eternal life by virtue of our baptism, there is nothing in this life that compares to that. That all our cares and concerns and worries and anxieties and sufferings and trials and tribulations, all those things that affect us personally, we in one sense should be able to bear and to endure and to deal with because they need not have an impact or an effect upon our soul or upon the destination of our souls. Instead, all our thoughts and our energies should be focused on our growing more deeply in holiness, more deeply in relationship with God, more deeply in our understanding of that wisdom which is given and gifted to us. To be able to learn from the scriptures, to be able to teach others, to be able to pray with confidence. Now surely my brothers and sisters, with these uh, miracles of resurrection, Holy Mother Church is making the point to us that of course, well, making the point to us that the words of the angel Gabriel to the Mother of God were true and are true and can be as true for us. Nothing is impossible with God. It is possible for us to be changed and to transform. It is possible for ourselves to change and transform ourselves if we would but co cooperate with God's grace. So that we need not be regarded like the ancient church regarded Lazarus and the uh, widow of name's son and the sons of the prophets uh, uh, that Elias uh, Elasius and Elias uh, raised should not like them be considered dead for we are and have been made alive in Christ and there my brothers and sisters should be the obvious stark contrast 
between ourselves and others around us who perhaps are not believers. Those who walk through this life, as it were, dead, dead to their sins. Whilst it is easy often for us to think perhaps in judgment or condemnation of those who we perceive to be dead to their sin, we are also prompted and reminded by the example of our Saviour that we should, like him, have compassion and pity on them. Indeed, we are reminded by the Divine Commission, the Great Commission to preach the Gospel, that many who are dead to sin are so, through ignorance, because they do not know or have not had the scriptures explained to them, because they have not had proper testimony of the gospel given to them or available to them to witness. There, of course, my brothers and sisters, as we reflected earlier this week, is the great problem and the great task for us as Christians to give a suitable witness by the living of our lives to the gospel that those who are ignorant of it may perceive it and seeing it become curious and draw near to ask us about it, to ask us why, why are you so different from everybody else? Why are you so generous compared to others? Why are you so charitable? Why are you so compassionate? Often, uh, my brothers and sisters online, one can get into all sorts of uh, scrapes and arguments and discussions uh, about ethics uh, and uh, philosophy. Um, and one of the things often uh, people who are non-believers will say, oh, well, you know, one can be a nice person without being a Christian. I don't have to become a Christian to be a nice person. I don't have to uh, uh, believe in an imaginary friend uh, uh, to make me be nice to others. And other uh, similar uh, things they say. And yet, the great body of evidence, of course, uh, suggests quite the opposite. In the sense that if you were to consider how much Holy Mother Church does around the world for charity, not for profit, for no, uh, not for the profit of the organisations or institutions, not for the profit of the people uh, employed or engaged with them, you think of all the hospitals, all the orphanages, all the schools, all the uh, homeless drop-ins, all the surgeries, uh, all these places around the world, particularly those places uh, that we call the third world. What there is not, and indeed even here in the West, what there is not is anything comparable to compare or contrast with the level of charity that the church manifests in our societies. So that literally, if the church were to cease all those charitable activities, that would have a huge impact on local communities and societies around the world. Imagine how many orphan children then will be left on the streets to die. Imagine how many starving, hungry, poor people will be left on the streets to die. Imagine how many people are unable to afford uh, medicine and medical treatment and operations would be left to die. Imagine how many elderly and lonely people will be left to despair and depression through isolation. How many drug addicts, how many alcoholics, how many others uh, would be left to eventually die of their addictions? 
Now, yes, there are, of course, a few secular institutions that exist as non-profits or as uh, charities. There are a few. And here in the UK, perhaps, uh, it's slightly different to other places in the world where we have the National Health Service, such blessed as it is and for as long or short a time as we may keep it. The truth of the matter is that even in our advanced societies and civilizations like America or in Europe, if all the hospitals and all the surgeries or for all the orphanages, etc., etc., uh, that are uh, run by the churches disappeared there would be a huge vacuum left behind well, I say a huge vacuum a vacuum uh, it suggests that it would be filled in rather a huge hole would be left behind and the point is there are very few who would fill that vacuum meaning there to suggest then that while indeed people can be nice to each other without, the, without a, a sense of uh, perhaps divine morality, nonetheless they don't feel compelled to be nice to one another. And there, my brothers and sisters, is the stark contrast and difference between us as Christians and people of faith and those who do not believe because our faith compels us to act our faith charges and wills us to act they even the purpose of our faith is to act and it is only in this action of course in this kind of testimony that unbelievers and non-believers might come to see the benefits of faith, the difference that faith makes. If perhaps they cannot see it in the wider society, then they ought at least to be able to see it in their personal interactions with Christians. And this is why it is important for us to remember as little anointed ones who bear the name Christian, we are called and charged to be Christ to the world around us. That we are called to die to self in order that Christ might grow within us and that his resurrection life might be perceived and understood through us. what is the purpose of having eternal life now what is the purpose of having baptism now what is the purpose of being changed and transformed in this life if others are not able to see it if the experience of it is not tangible is not empirical is not recognizable our life as Christians is not just about our interior spiritual uh, progression but should be evidenced by how that interior spiritual progression changes the way we externalize our faith ourselves our sense of self and here my brothers and sisters of course is the starkest contrast with the world around us that we are called like St Paul, to die such to ourselves that we may say it is not I who live but Christ who lives in me. Let us, my brothers and sisters, strive even more these last two weeks 
of this holy season to purify ourselves to make ourselves fit and worthy dwelling places for the Spirit of God to make ourselves become more like the vision and image of Jesus Christ let us strive to fulfill our share in his priestly ministry to both pray for and will the healing and the reconciliation of others with God but also too through bearing our own witness and testimony to the love of God that we have revealed and that we have received from Christ and seen in Christ and manifested to the world around us that we may be truly icons of Christ and show and demonstrate that we are living the resurrection life with him who is God, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.